perak Hey, welcome to my channel. Today I'm excited to take you on a thrilling adventure through history as we'll be embarking on a journey through the golden heart of a fascinating kingdom that has been waiting to be discovered. I guarantee you that this will be one interesting ride. So buckle up, grab a snack and let's go. Nestled deep in the heart of the Akan forest, away from the glimmering shores of the Gold Coast, lay the kingdom of Kumasi. For centuries, it toiled under the yoke of the Dentra Kingdom. But in 1701, a turning point came. A battle was fought, the Battle of Yase, and with a decisive and triumphant victory, Kumasi claimed his rightful place as an independent kingdom. Okay, maybe that was too brief. Let me try again. The kingdom of Dentra was the most powerful among the three Akan speaking people, who were engaged in profitable trade with the Dutch stationed at Elmina and of course rolling up everywhere they are not invited, the British on the Cape Coast. At the height of his power, the king of Dentra, Boan Pumsim, was so wealthy that he is credited as the first Akan ruler to employ an accountant to keep track of his vast estate. The kingdom of Dentra ensured the smooth flow of goods with its trading partners throughout the Akan region. To ensure this free trade, the kingdom heavily policed this trade routes, an endeavor that was quite expensive. To upset this course, the kingdom demanded exorbitant tributes and taxes from its citizens and conquered territories. This made the kingdom a force to be reckoned with, but at what cost? By 1694, Intim Jakero was sworn onto the stool after 40 years of Boan Pumsin's reign. Intim Jaker was a reckless and impulsive leader who made the one fatal mistake of increasing the already excessive tributes. The tributary kingdoms refused and banded together against Dentra. Osei Tutu of Kumasi led his alliance. The Dentra ham was defeated in the brutal and bloody battle of Fiasse. This was the battle of the Asante Empire. The Asante Empire flourished with unparalleled minds and wealth. Thanks to the staggering amount of gold it extracted from the Ofin or Da River, this golden abundance not only made Ashanti rich, but also empowered them to purchase guns from the Dutch. This gave them an advantage as they became a formidable force, easily dominating other Akan speaking kingdoms and solidifying their reign as a true empire. In terms of wealth and prosperity, its riches were unparalleled, even when compared to the legendary empire of Ghana also known as the land of gold. While the empire of Ghana may have earned its title, it paled when compared to Asante. The sheer magnitude of the Asante's kingdom wealth is staggering. So to help us understand the wealth of the Asante kingdom, let's look at the output of gold, which was estimated to be about 7,000 tons by the early 1900s. That is equivalent to $455 billion today. As you can see, it's quite difficult to imagine how much gold was flowing through this kingdom at its peak. The extraction of this gold was a grueling tax, which was carried out by enslaved individuals who toiled tirelessly. The gold was stored in form of gold dust, which along with carry shells was used as currency in the region. The process of evaluating and manipulating the gold was a complex and highly specialized tax, requiring the expertise of skilled craftsmen in Kumasi. The Asante Empire was a theocratic state that boasted an impressive bureaucracy which was responsible for all aspects of state affairs. Its foreign office was a crucial component in managing trade and treaties with each relationship managed by a separate department within the foreign office, showcasing the empire's dedication to efficiency and organization. The treasury office was another key player with its vast gold reserves playing a significant role in maintaining the empire's power and prosperity. At the end of this dynamic system was the Jasehene, who led the civil service. The Sikedra Kofi was the ultimate symbol of power, held in high reverence among the people of the Asante kingdom. 
This golden stool is said to contain the soul of every Asante citizen and it's also the throne of the Asante Ene, the emperor of the Asante Empire. According to legend, the stool descended from the heavens and landed on the lap of Osie Tutu, the first Asante Ene, and has remained a coveted symbol ever since. Like I said earlier, the emperor of the Asante Empire is called the Asante Ene, who is the most powerful person in the empire. He serves as the head of state, the commander-in-chief of the army, and the highest judge in the empire. The Ohema, also known as the Queen Mother, plays a very pivotal role in the Asante Empire. In addition to her judicial and legislative roles, and also being a member of the World Council, she had the responsibility of unpicking and nominating candidates to be the next emperor. Her selections had to be approved by a council of district chiefs and then face an election. If elected, the new emperor was responsible for upholding Asante law, which primarily consists of religious tenets and the protection of the nation. However, if the Asante Hene broke any of his oaths, he could be impeached through a process called distillment. This involved removing his sandals and knocking him down three times, stripping him of his authority and symbols of office. The Asante Hene shared power with the Asante Mayen Chiemu, a national assembly of senior chiefs and rulers who met annually to resolve disputes and make decisions for the state. The Asante Hene was also advised by the Asante Kotoko, a council of wealthy nobles who served both judicial and legislative functions. The Asante Empire was built on the foundation of the family unit. Each family was comprised of relatives who could trace back to a common female ancestor. This family unit was led by the Odikru, who was elected through a democratic process. This is a recurring pattern throughout the empire's hierarchy. Families then came together to form a village. Villages then came together to form a district that was ruled by the Hohene. Then multiple districts combined to form a kingdom that was overseen by the Amahene. Finally, all the kingdoms were united under the rule of the Asante Hene to create the mighty Asante Empire. This system of elected leaders and the bond of family tide played a crucial role in shaping this empire. Kumasi was the ever busy capital city of the Asante Empire. Ununiformed police manned and regulated who entered the city, while a secret police force called the Akombia protected the interests of the Asante Ene by gathering intelligence and suppressing any rebellion. This powerful combination allowed the Asante Empire to maintain its dominance through the 19th into the 20th century. From Kumasi, the Asante government received tributes from over 40 kingdoms. The amount of tribute each kingdom had to pay was subject to change, and a special court handled any dispute that may arise. And yes, the Dutch and the British also had to pay rent to Kumasi. Society and societal status was based on wealth and family ties. The royal family was on top of society and then followed by an affluent noble upper class called the Sikapo. The lower class were free but poor and at the bottom of society were enslaved individuals who were faced with manual labor, conscripted military service and human sacrifice. Despite the division in the society, it was forbidden by law to discuss any other person's social background, allowing even Akan speaking slaves to become valuable members of an Asante family. A few individuals were able to achieve great wealth through their business ventures and were recognized by the Asante Ene as part of the noble class. To maintain the monarchy's power, laws were put in place to prevent the growth of a strong merchant class that could pose a threat. The Treasury Department dispatched hundreds of tax collectors to enforce a stringent inheritance tax. Upon the death of a wealthy individual, only a small portion of the wealth was passed on to their heir, while the majority was seized and became part of the royal estate. The Asante Empire maintained its domination of the Akan region through military force. The power of the army was not solely due to the use of guns, but primarily due to the level of organization the army had which was unparalleled to any of his neighboring states. Although this empire was built through war, it was maintained through peace. Life in the countryside of the Asante Empire was the contrast to the energy of Kumasi. Most of the villages were composed of small families who earned their livelihood through agriculture. These villages often had one street, 
which served as a gathering space for the community. In the evening, villagers usually would spend their days strolling along the street, socializing and enjoying relaxing activities. For most villagers, life was peaceful and predictable. Well, this is where we're going to stop, as we were just looking at a brief history of the Asante Empire. With its rich and complex history, there is so much to learn. If you enjoyed this video, I have good news for you, as this video is just one of several videos that were uploaded at the same time as part of the Untold Black History series. That's why the cool intro was there, and I know you will enjoy the other videos too, so please check them out. So if you have any question that you like answered, you can leave it in the comment below. Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell notification so that you don't miss any future video. Thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next one. Bye.